Okay, do we have critical mass? I think some of the principals are still out outside, but uh, wow, that was, gosh, I, didn't, I had no idea that I could get people to be quiet. Was, <laughs> that was good, that was good. I think the doors are closing and other people will be straying in. So did you make any new friends? Did you meet some new people while you were outside? Good. Well, I'm having a great time. And you know, one of, the, one of the good parts about being the moderator is that you do get to meet a lot of people. And I just came across some fasc fascinating people. I, I talked with somebody who's having trouble getting her transcripts, so I'm hoping I, she's been connected to the right person. I just want everyone to know I cannot solve those problems. <laughs> but there are people here who can. I um, spoke with a wonderful woman whose uh, son, is, who's actually, she said, I'm not a Columbia person, but I'm here with my sister. Her son is taking a Kaplan SAT course this morning, and she said as a parent, she learned a lot and um, you know, thinks this would be a good place for her son. So please apply. We hope that he's studying hard on, those, on that test. A couple, another announcement. Um, uh, Darren Cohen and uh, Ken Tamashiro, who you know uh, as the, our representative here for the Columbia Club, um, wants to remind all of you Washington, D.C. residents that there will be uh, elections, and they're looking for people to volunteer, elections for the club officers, and they're looking for people to volunteer or to suggest other people for the Columbia University Club of Washington, D.C. You can find out more at cucdc.org, cucdc.org. So please volunteer and please seek out Ken and Darren. Do you guys want to stand up so people will know who you are? So those who are ready to lead in DC can contact you. Now, actually, I want to make sure that Linda is, okay, everybody's back there, great. Okay, I just wanted to have eyesight of the people who are coming on. Before I bring out our next panelist, I just spoke with someone who said, I came for two reasons, and one of them was to hear this panel. So you, have, you already have an enthusiastic audience member. Scott Tatican uh, told me that he's the chief statistician for Genworth Financial, which is the world's largest provider of long-term care insurance. And he knows a lot, wants to connect with other Columbia people who want to talk about these very important issues. So do you want to stand up just so people know you? Chief statistician at Genworth. This is, shows you it, Columbia is leading. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce Dean Linda Freed, who is a leader in the fields of epidemiology and geriatrics. She's been a dedicated uh, leader in, in medicine uh, and science of healthy aging. She's been named a living legend in medicine by the US Congress. And she has been dean of the Mailman School of Public Health since 2008. We talked a little bit earlier because I said, you know, I really hate to just give that sort of standard resume thing. And as we were talking, I was feeling her enthusiasm for the work she's doing, really just how exciting a field public health is and how Mailman is one of the leading, as you know, public health schools in the world. But one thing she told me that I found absolutely fascinating, one of her first initiatives was to create a Columbia Public Health Oath, um, inspired by the Hippocratic Oath to give voice to the aspirations and responsibilities of public health to society. So she's really making a difference already. Dean Linda Freed. Thank you, Alilia, for that very gracious introduction, and, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I f deeply, and I think increasingly every day, feel how critical it is for us to have great universities that make a great society, and it is the partnership of those who have been in that great university ensuring it, its greatness for the future that uh, I think our society rests on. 
I'm very excited, given the conversation that we just had in the, in the prior panel, to try and think about one of the many important intersections between science, a discussion of the morning, and leadership, a discussion of the morning. And I think one of those very important intersections is rests in public health as the science, uh, uh, a scientific basis of much of the leadership needed, I think, in, in coming years. And today we have um, three fabulous alumni who are leaders at that intersection between science and policy based on great leadership with the charge in each of their sectors to improve the public's health on a local, national, and international level. And they truly exemplify, I think, the catchphrase of our school, which is science, action, impact. They represent, moreover, three different sectors now of the public health enterprise in a great society, academia, government, and NGOs, all trained at one school, all with a common foundation in the science and evidence of how to improve the public's health, and each with an understanding of the common responsibilities and aspirations we have societally, and the different roles that each different sector must play individually and together. I'd like to introduce the members of our panel today um, with actually great excitement and then make a few opening remarks before we turn to our discussion on protecting the public's health through effective US and global health policy with a focus on the challenges and the leadership needed. I'll start first at the other end of the row with Dr. Wafa El Sadr. Dr. El Sadr uh, graduated uh, from our School of Public Health in 1991 with an MPH after she had her MD. And she's an internationally renowned research scientist and infectious disease physician and global leader in bringing science, public health, and medicine to HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, tuberculosis other infectious diseases, and in the form of the health systems that really create health for particularly vulnerable populations around the world. Wafa wears several hats at Columbia. She's a professor of epidemiology and medicine at the Mailman School in the College of Physicians and Surgeons. She's the director of the International Center for AIDS, Program, AIDS Care and Treatment Programs, better known as ICAP. ICAP recently celebrated a milestone of serving one million people in 15 countries in Africa. Great. Wafa also leads the Global Health Initiative at Columbia's Mailman School and Columbia University's Presidential Commission on Global Health. She is a member, an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, and was named almost simultaneously by Rolling Stone magazine as one of the top 100 people who are changing America and at the, in the same week as one of Scientific American's top 10 who are guiding science for humanity. <laughs> Next to Dr. El Sadr is Dr. Cheryl Hilton. Cheryl uh, received her DRPH in 1991 from the School of Public Health, and she has dedicated her career to finding real-world solutions to preventing smoking and hel helping people quit smoking. She is the founding CEO of the Legacy Foundation, where she has guided the highly acclaimed National Youth Tobacco Prevention Campaign, which is called Truth. In the past 10 years, Truth has prevented almost half a million kids from smoking. Cheryl was, uh, for a number of years, the chair of the Department of Sociomedical Sciences in our school of public health, but she has had many roles as author, researcher, professor, administrator, with more than 25 years of experience across all the dimensions of the public health enterprise. She's a frequent public speaker, appears frequently on Good Morning America, The Today Show, and recently on MSNBC's Cigarette Wars. Cheryl, welcome. Thank you.
And last, but certainly not least, Julie Piotrowski. Julie received her MPH from our school in 2008. Uh, she's a former journalist who has spent more than a decade researching, analyzing, and reporting public health issues and developing health promotion and disease prevention programs. She is currently a, the speechwriter at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. Howard Koh. As a Knight Public Health Journalism Fellow prior to that at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, she trained with the U.S. Epidemic Intelligence Service and assisted in creating effective health communication strategies for our country and for the world. While working before that at the Mailman School's National Center for Disaster Preparedness, Julie developed bioterrorism and emergency preparedness programs for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So we are thrilled to have you here today. And um, in preparation for this, I, I reread a statement, Julie, by your boss, Dr. Howard Koh, who pointed out that in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services report for Healthy People 2010, we have to remember that health of the individual is, quote unquote, almost inseparable from health of the larger community. I would add, beyond that, that public health has been built over the last 100 plus years from a scientific base of recognizing that an individual's health is actually dependent on the larger community. A few examples, uh, whether one is by birth part of a group that experiences significant vulnerability and health disparities because of their place in society, whether a child living with people who smoke or in a family that is overweight is a greater risk of becoming a smoker or overweight. The answer is yes. Whether nutritious foods are available is often not the option of the individual. Whether people can walk or play outside safely goes beyond the individual's ability to control. Air pollution, or how well we prepare for earthquakes, tsunamis, or other exposures are all issues of how the community, the community's preparation, the community's anticipation, the community's response, in knowledgeable ways across all sectors protects our collective health. 60 to 80% of a population's health is dependent on public health approaches. It's been said that even when public health works best, and when it's working best, we count on it, but it is invisible. And it is the disease we didn't get, the accident we didn't have, the disaster that didn't happen, and a key challenge for leaders on something that when successful is invisible and when unsuccessful you get blamed for, <laughs> is how to lead not just to sustain the successes that we count on for the present, but to anticipate the challenges ahead of us which are highly complicated, and to, both to prepare for them and to create broad understanding ar across all communities about what's in it for all of us and what role we all have to play. So it turns out uh, that in fact, public health is now recognized as an intersectoral responsibility. Every sector in society, every educated person, every person in society benefits from it and in fact, must understand the problems ahead and help lead on it as well. Um, I think that the conversation on this, in my experience, has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, perhaps because many of the challenges ahead of us are not invisible, although a recognition of the sector responsible sometimes may be. Um, Clearly, discussions at the World Economic Forum which uh, recently, which I had the privilege of um, joining President Bollinger for, exemplified that corporations, government, civil society all recognize, uh, as, as spoken by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, that public health solutions 
are a key part of all of our well-being from uh, national security to actually uh, the diseases we do or do not wake up with in the morning. So with that background, I'd like to turn to the panel and the topic at hand, which is protecting the public's health through effective U.S. and global health policy. And um, not coincidentally, as I said, we have both three fabulous alumni who are leaders in their own right, but three alumni who represent different sectors, uh, not all the sectors, but three sectors of um, the, what enables us to protect the public's health. And so I'd like to start out by asking each of our panelists to comment on, for the sector that they are currently working in, what are its responsibilities for protecting the public's health and how does it build on science and evidence to accomplish that? And I'll start with Julie Piotrowski. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here this morning in conversation with such a diverse group of leaders and future leaders and to learn from the group. Um, while most of you are not public health professionals, as Dean Fried said, the work of public health affects you every day. And after a few years of covering health as a journalist, I realized that to do my best work, I needed to really develop an understanding of, of public health, and that led me to the Mailman School of Public Health, where I am very grateful for the outstanding education that I received working with so many leaders across um, many different sectors to ultimately um, promote and protect health and assure that all people can reach their highest attainable standard of health. Um, at Mailman, our statement of values reads, and this is applicable to the field of public health in general, and I quote, we are committed to principles of social justice and to the promotion of health as a fundamental right of every human being. We aspire to alleviate human suffering and improve the health of all populations, especially the most vulnerable through research, service, communication, and informed advocacy. So the statement or concept that health is a fundamental right is really key. Um, in this nation, we have differences in terms of wealth. Uh, we have people with smaller incomes, and we have millionaires and multimillionaires. We have differences in education from those with a high school uh, level education to those with multiple advanced degrees. We have differences in employment. Um, my grandmother was a school custodian for years. We have CEOs and folks on the uh, Forbes, um, you know, Fortune 500 list. And these are differences that we accept. But we, what we do not accept and what we should not accept are differences in health or health disparities that, as Dean Freed said, are linked with social and economic or environmental disadvantages. And so while medical advances and new technologies have provided us with the potential for longer and healthier lives and better quality of life, we have these disparities that exist in, in the US and continue to affect um, multiple groups of people. So differences based on gender, uh, religion, um, sexual orientation, race and eth eth ethnic group, uh, geographic location, or some other characteristic that's historically uh, linked with discrimination or exclusion. So where we live and learn and work and play and, and pray even in some cases uh, affects our health. And it is very true that the health of the individual is inseparable from the health of the community. And so both government and all of us as um, a component of good citizenship have a responsibility for building healthy societies um, and creating the conditions in which people can be healthy. And to do this, we do need, as the Dean uh, said, a health in all policies approach, um, integrating health policy efforts with those related to agriculture, business, education, housing, transportation, and other areas outside of the health sector. So. One example um, from my work is the First Lady's uh, initiative, Let's Move to End Childhood Obesity Within a Generation. And there's a component of this campaign called the Healthy uh, Food Financing Initiative, and this is a program that increases uh, the availability and affordability of healthy foods in underserved neighborhoods, so both urban and rural. And uh, it brings grocery stores to what we call food desert communities. So these are communities and neighborhoods that don't have um, access for residents to affordable, healthy food. And to support this initiative, we have a multi-sector partnership between the Departments of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, uh, the Department of Treasury, 
And they've partnered together to make about $400 million in financing uh, to community development and financial institutions available so that um, both these uh, groups and also non-for-profits and public partners can come together and look at strategies for bringing grocery stores into communities. So that's just one example to illustrate the kind of partnerships that we're talking about. Um, it was with this interest in creativity and innovation in public health partnerships and leadership and in planning that I came to Health and Human Services a couple years ago. And every day I pass through the lobby of the Hubert H. Humphrey building named for former Senator Hubert Humphrey. And there's a quote that is on the wall that I look at every day as I go up to my office. And that quote reads, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. So at Health and Human Services, whether it's providing millions of children and families and seniors with access to high quality health care, or exploring uh, new frontiers of biomedical research and science as the discussions um, highlighted this morning, it's our obligation as a department and as a government working across agencies uh, in the US and abroad to make investments where they'll reach the most people, where they will build most effectively on the efforts of our partners and where they'll lead to the biggest gains in health and ultimately uh, opportunity for all. So at the heart of all of our work, what we really strive to do is to create better systems of prevention to um, prevent disease from occurring instead of treating disease too late, despite the fact that we have an incredible healthcare system in this country, the best in the world, arguably, with doctors and nurses and other professionals who um, do incredible, incredible work. And I think for me, it's been a privilege to work for an administration that understands the power of prevention at all levels in society, at the individual level, at the business level, um, and in communities as well as at the national level. So um, much about what we've heard on the healthcare law so far has been focused on insurance reform, but this is a law that really brings prevention to the forefront of our national conversation, and I'm happy to detail some of the prevention provisions later. But um, the most important thing is that while uh, it's not a panacea for eliminating all of the health disparities that we face, it's a great start, and we do need uh, the cooperation and creativity and innovation of everyone across sectors to help people truly reach their highest attainable standard of health. Thanks, Julie. The policies that you... That was very eloquent and, and I think exemplifies many of the policies on prevention uh, that we, uh, that the government is implementing and that are deep, actually substantively, substantively based on public health science and prevention science coming out of schools of public health. Uh, Cheryl, I wonder if you could talk about how that same base of evidence and knowledge drives the actions of the Legacy Foundation and similar uh, nonprofit foundations. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here today among the alums in the Washington area and others. My, my two favorite alums of all are in the audience, my husband from the School of Public Health and my daughter from Columbia College. <laughs> Shout out to you. <laughs> um, but let, let me just start by following on with the, with the basic overarching framework, and that is a framework of social justice and the fact that we just don't have it. We don't have it here in the United States of America, and we most certainly do not have it around the world. And in terms of the world health definition of health, an absence of disease, but also well-being, social well-being, um, we are probably, in many respects, moving in the wrong direction, and in a handful, moving in the right direction. In, in that overarching picture, the NGO community, as it's called globally, and the nonprofit community, uh, of which I am a part, as it is known uh, here in the US, has an extraordinarily important role to play um, as partners uh, with government, as partners with philanthropy, as partners with basically every individual that wants to address um, the key killers uh, in, our, in our society, uh, which differ, of course, in the in developed world and other parts of the world. Um, 
first and foremost, the nonprofit sector needs to be a catalyst. It needs to be the drumbeat. It needs to be the aggravating voice that's demanding that the right thing be done. It also needs to motivate uh, philanthropy. The United States uh, probably donates more money globally uh, on a, both an individual and governmental, uh, in fact, it certainly does, than, the other, than any other country in the world. But we also, as individuals, donate more uh, than virtually any other country in the world. And that is a big piece of the engine that drives the nonprofit sector, which is extremely broad and well-developed in our nation. So let me just turn to tobacco as an example, simply because it is incredibly unique. And I want to point out a few of the uniquenesses about it. Um, because if it is left unchecked, we are looking at a really extraordinary calamity uh, that will be facing us. Let's start with the fact that tobacco is a global health crisis. It is 100% preventable tobacco-related death by simply not using the product. By the close of the century, the World Health Organization has estimated that one billion people will die as a result of tobacco. Let me repeat that, one billion people. Presently, five million people worldwide die every year of tobacco. And in contrast to our experience in New York or Washington, that somehow the tobacco epidemic is getting under control, the sad global fact is that it's wildly out of control. And the rate of smoking is rising around the world wherever there is a vulnerable population that the tobacco industry can get its clutches on. For example, just one statistic, 60% of girls in Santiago, Chile smoke. While in our country, that number is, uh, is, is one third of that, and still that's a disaster. 45 million Americans still smoke. Only 5% of the world's population is covered by clean indoor air laws. And in fact, right now, soon, there'll be a book coming out of Columbia Press that Legacy underwrote, uh, um, I think initially made the grant probably in 2002. And I love the title of the book. It's called After Tobacco. I go to bed at night, put my head on my pillow and try to imagine after tobacco. For me, it's particularly hard because Legacy uh, is a foundation that was created out of threatened litigation by 46 states attorneys general against the tobacco industry. And the tobacco industry uh, settled in lieu of pursuing 46 separate litigations. And a lot of things changed as a result of that agreement. And that agreement is a model that can be used globally uh, by law enforcement officials to institute and generate significant change and significant uh, public health protections uh, for individuals. What it did is create the Legacy Foundation, among other things that it did. And Legacy was then able to be a counterweight to the $13 billion a year, that's $13 billion, that the tobacco industry spends marketing its products in the United States alone, which is an enormous amount of money. And to put it in some, to, in some perspective, they spend in a day what Legacy spends in a year to combat them. Uh, they attempted to shut us down. We were in litigation for five and a half years. Uh, so an industry that creates a product that when used as directed kills 50% of its users uh, and makes the enormous profits it makes here in this world and exports now throughout the world is one of the principal ambassadors for our country around the world. Is that a situation that we really uh, want to prevail? Well, another model of how you can bring science and public health together has miraculously happened in this country. We now have food and drug and, uh, FDA authority over tobacco. And there are many exciting things happening on that front. Probably the most exciting is the release of a report just a week ago that found that leaving menthol in cigarettes, all other flavorings were removed in the bill that went through Congress, but leaving menthol in cigarettes will entice more young people to smoke and lead to far fewer people quitting. Um, this, this report is being fought you know, uh, vociferously by the tobacco industry, but it's a classic example where the FDA has empowered a science panel to bring to them the facts. And it's probably for those who have any interest in the subject worth going to the FDA website to see the rebuttal that the tobacco industry put together. Um, but they are vigorously fighting that. On a global scale, 
uh, there is something called the framework, uh, con the, the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is a series of about 16 key recommendations that every country should implement if there is any hope to turn the tide on this tsunami of a billion lives that we will lose uh, throughout this coming century. Um, virtually every country in the world has ratified the treaty. The treaty has been a bit of a problem for the U.S. and for Germany because it, it initially encouraged the cessation of commercial speech rights with respect to tobacco. I personally favor severing those rights. To me, it's no different than saying you can't jump up and say fire in the audience if there is no fire in the room. The fact of the matter is that we protect the right of the tobacco industry to promote its product, and through the promotion of its product, it manages to addict millions of people, almost always uh, under the age of 18, at a time when their brains are not developed sufficiently to understand the decision they're making, and by the time uh, they understand it, they're addicted. So we have a model in the framework, uh, the WHO Framework Convention for Tobacco Control that could be applied to many, many other problems. And the sort of the science public health call to action for all of us and for NGOs and nonprofits in particular um, is to embrace the Millennium World Health Organization goals for our world. We are talking about obesity in the, in the United States of America. One in four children are underweight around the world. So we have a, a dichotomy that's, you sort of wish you could take the food from one place and put it over to the other place. But that's obviously an oversimplification. The millennium, the millennium goals, the majority of those goals, which are the goals for the health and social welfare of the world, are in fact health related. And they cannot be achieved without the proactive engagement of the nonprofit sector, the government sectors within countries, um, intergovernmental agencies, individuals, and most especially the social responsibility of the corporate community. And that is one of the reasons why I will just close by returning to the tobacco industry. Because there, if there ever was an example of an industry that simply should not exist, that is it. You take that and you go through the continuum of the human health problems that other industries are capable of causing. And we need to understand that on the one hand, we are partners, but on the other hand, we must be regulators as well so that we can control um, profits being put ahead of human health, which happen in every country uh, on the planet. And, and that is a very important thing for us all to collectively address. So thank you for your time. So we're in part trying to exemplify the, the distinct but complementary roles of different sectors in contributing to the public's health. And as I said, of course, both government and nonprofits and corporate actions draw heavily on the science <coughs> as well as the educational responsibilities of schools of public health. And I'll turn to Wafa to um, provide perhaps some examples of how uh, the actions and roles of schools of public health lay that foundation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Linda. And I'm also very thrilled to be here and to meet uh, graduates of the school, of Mailman, as well as other alumni, and to be especially to be on this panel with colleagues. Um, I guess what I'll start with is maybe uh, sharing with you um, Issue, one issue that has dominated my thinking over the past um, several years, which is um, this issue of uh, the schism that exists between uh, knowledge and action. And uh, sometimes, I, I, sometimes people have called it the, the gap between the know and the do, and others have called it the responsibility gap. And what is this schism and what is this gap? And the schism is really about what we know, the information we have today and the knowledge we have today and how that contrasts with what we've done and what we're doing uh, in the world. And then I'll circle back and maybe share with you ways in which I think public health can really bridge that schism and bridge that gap and really take on this responsibility gap, fill the responsibility gap in the world, including, of course, the United States. So we have a lot of knowledge. We, we have a lot of information. We have a lot of tools at our hands. Uh, for example, we know how to 
create clean water. We know how to diagnose various diseases. We know how to give vaccinations. We have remarkable vaccines. We know how to prevent HIV. We know how to treat HIV. We know how to prevent mothers from dying in childbirth. We know how to resuscitate babies and keep them alive. So we have all this knowledge, but then you look on the other hand, when you contrast the wealth of knowledge we have today, we don't have all the answers. We need a lot more answers, but we have a lot of knowledge in our knowledge bag, in our toolbox. And then you contrast what we know versus the state of global health, and whether that be in the US or internationally. And you can see the schism that exists. And uh, why is there such, such a schism? And uh, I think one of the reasons is that uh, we have uh, valued very much um, the discovery of knowledge. And that's very important. I'm, I'm abso absolutely uh, support the need for discovery and the need for more and more discovery. The discovery of knowledge, and I believe we have not valued as much. How do we take that knowledge into action? We've assumed that once a discovery is made, that somehow magically it's gonna be disseminated successfully and it's gonna happen and the world will reap the benefits of that knowledge. And the reality is that that doesn't happen because there is a science and there are skills, there's information, there's a way, there's a, the how to actually take the knowledge into action is a science by itself that, has not, that I believe has been underappreciated uh, thus far. Now there's a long history actually in, in thinking back about some of the, uh, when uh, President Bollinger was speaking about Colombia and the history of Colombia, there's a, uh, when I was reading about the history of Colombia at some point, uh, in the 1930s, a former president of Colombia, uh, President Lowe, gave a very important speech um, that uh, challenged universities at that point in time and challenged educators at that point in time to think be beyond the walls of universities and think about how they're educating students and think of the responsibility of the university to its community. And at that time, he was challenging Columbia to think beyond the walls of Columbia and think of New York City in the 1930s and how can the city inform the education of the students and how can the city inform the actions of the university. And reflecting on that and the university today, not just Columbia, but all universities is not only are we, we have to think beyond the walls of our universities to our immediate community, but now we are global universities. We have to think about the, the walls, what, what lies behind the wall of the university, not just in our community in New York City for Columbia, but globally and how what happens in the world should inform what we do as an education institution, but also how we prepare our students for the future. So going back to that schism and that responsibility gap that I mentioned, I think there are ways in which, and I believe quite strongly that public health has a unique role to play, a unique role in the discovery of new knowledge but a very unique role in bridging that schism, in actually bringing knowledge to action. And in the science and the study of how do you disseminate, how do you implement, how do you scale up pieces of information, pieces of science, tools, to have an impact on the world, to have an impact on our own city, and as well as also to have an impact on the world as a whole. And I think that's where I see the schools, academia in general, but I see mailmen in particular in filling that responsibility gap. And uh, just to reflect a bit on what we're trying to do at mailmen to, to bridge that gap and to go from discovery to action, uh, I always think when I go and visit some of the programs overseas and I walk to uh, our a country office in, uh, where ICAP works in Ethiopia or Lesotho or Swaziland, and these are very, very poor countries uh, facing huge global challenges. I'm always heartened by the cycle, the cycle of uh, discovery and action and how we actually can close that circle very effectively. When I see uh, our own team uh, doing public health in action, they're innovating, uh, they're learning by doing and they're taking what they're learning, they're learning from what they're doing, but they're also discovering by doing. 
and then they take these innovations and they take them back right into the field to the science of action. And then they bring it back again to discovery and innovation. And it's, it's quite interesting to when you see this very dynamic process happening on the ground. We've always assumed that it has to happen somehow in our own backyard or in our own academic institutions, but we can also nurture this kind of discovery as well as this kind of action and the closing of the circle between the discovery and the action, we can nurture that to happen all around the world by just always thinking of that schism and always trying to bridge that schism and trying to think of the ways in which our, our knowledge and the tools we have today can advance uh, global health. So I feel very privileged actually in thinking about the, the potential for uh, public health and the potential for the university in this point in history as a catalyst for uh, generating knowledge and science, but also as a catalyst for taking that into action through very rigorous scientific endeavor. And I think it's by doing this that we can actually change the world bit by bit, but we can uh, take on and be the leaders in uh, closing this uh, responsibility gap. Thank you. Well, Each of you are, are confronted in the spheres you're in with, uh, with both responsibility and knowledge of a responsibility gap uh, that you have to close at, at different levels uh, in terms of individuals where you're seeking to do prevention and provide better care uh, in communities, for countries, uh, the frame that Julie was talking in, and globally. And we're confronted with the need to link science and policy um, in, in particular in the face of uh, highly complex issues where perhaps the solutions uh, exist at levels where we didn't look for them before. Cheryl started by talking about uh, treaties, for example. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on um, some models of, of governance that, that we need to reach for that would best implement government, governance or systems that would best implement for the sake of the public's health um, the knowledge that we have but we're not using. Now Cheryl, could you, could you maybe go back to the uh, Global Health Treaty example on tobacco, which mm -hmm. as, as you uh, suggested is, is novel and what its implications might be there? Well, the implications are profound in the sense that um, uh, there are many articles related to this treaty um, and it took literally years to negotiate and the negotiations were a combination of, of policy, science and government uh, and business leaders from around the globe and the, the, the treaty itself um, calls upon nations to, to implement price and tax measures to reduce the demand of tobacco. It calls upon them to um, protect p individuals from exposure to secondhand smoke, which kills 600,000 uh, uh, 600, people worldwide each year, uh, to regulate the contents of tobacco products, uh, which I was alluding to earlier in the case of menthol, which will be a battle royal uh, in this country, uh, to change the packaging. Um, the, uh, you may find it interesting that uh, tobacco, a uh, pack of cigarettes in Taiwan, 50% um, of the pack is covered with a warning label and has been for years. Uh, and we ship cigarettes with that warning label out of our country. And we do the same from our country into Canada, but we still do not have anything that could be uh, legitimately called um, an effective warning label, but we do now thanks to the FDA. Um, it also regulates, uh, it also calls upon nations to regulate tobacco advertising, most especially um, advertising that reaches children and product placement in television and film, which has been one of the most controversial uh, components of it from the tobacco industry's perspective because for, for years they've spent um, millions and millions and millions of dollars to get people to smoke in movies. Um, Christopher Reeve smoked Marlboros in Superman um, in exchange for $1.5 million as just one example. Um, and also 
uh, the, 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 uh, the articles call upon the uh, countries to treat uh, addiction. And one of the wonderful elements in the new health reform bill in our nation is that we will now be calling upon all health plans uh, to treat addiction, which has not been the case. Uh, we still need to do a little more work in terms of Medicaid, the, the program for the poor. So this type of a model uh, has put into um, action in virtually every country in the world activities related to this, the first health treaty um, in the history of the world. We've had many, many treaties, but we've not had one that was focused on health. So it's a very viable model um, and one that I think should be replicated, as do I believe the model of the MSA can and ought to be replicated in nations where um, consumer protection falls within a legal framework that allows the equivalent of our attorneys general in other countries to intercede on behalf of the public and protect them uh, through, through laws and through threat of litigation um, and the like. So we have the tools in our toolkit. Um, we need to use them uh, aggressively. And I think at the end of the day, um, there is no, as Wafa just pointed out so eloquently, there, there are very few health problems that exist in the world today that we don't have the solution for. Uh, in, science, in, in medicine, it's called, you know, from the bench to the bedside. Uh, we are not doing the bench to the bedside on the public health uh, framework uh, as well as we might, uh, simply because we are, we are unable to mobilize the forces, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with, with political stability in countries, um, with the legitimacy of the leadership of the countries, and a lot of it, sadly, has to do with um, our own mobilization of infrastructure. Linda, you said, what was the one thing we could do? You know, we have health reform, but uh, the overwhelming majority of physicians and the vast majority of public health professionals in the U.S. and worldwide believe that the quickest way to improve the health of our country is a single payer system. Everyone has a ticket to the ball game, so to speak, and we are not wasting huge amounts of money um, and diversions. We didn't get that, we got something halfway there, and I'll take half a loaf before I'll take no loaf any day of the week. Um, and for a variety of political reasons, uh, what a lot of people knew was the best thing to do simply could not happen. What we have is good. My hope is that we can get good to be good to great. Thank you. So before, I, I'm gonna cue the audience by saying we're going to move to a question and answer session in just a moment. Um, so while you're thinking about your, either your questions or your answers, um, I, I'll give the last uh, question to Julie. Um, Cheryl has done her usual elegant job, as ha has Wafa, in, in laying out uh, the dimensions of uh, a what public health scientists and professionals would call a multi-sector and multi-level approach at every level of society uh, so that everybody's doing their part to uh, accomplish the public's health, uh, whether it's labeling on packages or um, grocery stores in cities that have none. Uh, those are actually public health interventions. Can you um, tell us, Julie, why, what difference investing in prevention makes in terms of population's health? Sure. Well, I'm glad that uh, Cheryl used the word mobilization. That is part of the new mission statement of our office, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, formerly the Office of Public Health and Science. We've had a name change. Um, and our mission statement is mobilizing leadership in science and prevention for a healthier nation. So obviously all of us at some point in our lives will be affected by a health issue or our families will or our friends. And you know, health is a gift and we don't wanna be treating disease after the fact if we don't have to, um, despite our incredible health system and the people who work in it to save lives every day. Um, we want to be able to bring down costs. We want to be able to work both at the individual level and at the community level to uh, prevent disease, promote health, and ensure that people can enjoy their life. I mean, health is you know, a beautiful mm -hmm. gift, so mm -hmm. um, why, why suffer if we don't need to? Um, 
so the Affordable Care Act is just one component of prevention that is really focused on expanding access to care, bringing down cost, and also improving uh, health care quality. And so when we think about prevention, we also think about uh, preventing health care associated infections in hospitals. We think about um, prevention as far as um, medical errors. And there are so many components of this law that emphasize prevention throughout the health care system uh, to bring down costs, but ultimately to improve quality for patients and to improve quality of life and to ensure that people get the care that they need when they need it. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, much of the conversation at the national level about this law has been focused on the respective insurance provisions that will um, afford people more access. But what we really haven't talked about as a nation is the um, expansive, unprecedented investment in prevention at every level. And so that means, for example, at the individual level, um, you now will be able to go to your doctor and uh, without paying a co-payment, receive uh, clinical preventive services. So um, assistance with smoking cessation, assistance with uh, counseling for nutrition, and this applies to children as well as adults. Um, if you are an older person in Medicare, you will be able to receive uh, a health and wellness visit. You'll work with your doctor to put together uh, a, a wellness plan. Um, and this, of course, is gonna cost um, time you know, for physicians to learn how to, um, you know, devote more time to these kinds of conversations with patients. But the key is that they will be reimbursed. And so we're changing through healthcare reform our um, payment models so that we're um, giving incentives for physicians to implement prevention in the clinical visit. At the uh, business level, we have all sorts of provisions in this law to ensure the expansion of uh, employee wellness programs. We have uh, new federal initiatives that will be looking at um, providing businesses with uh, assistance for their workplace wellness programs, technical assistance. At the community level, we have community transformation grants, um, millions and millions of dollars that are invested in tobacco cessation, in obesity prevention, and ensuring that the models that we're putting into place are um, effective, that they're evidence-based, that they've been proven to be effective, and then that we're scaling them up in a way that is meaningful for those communities, but also ensuring that we give communities some flexibility to, um, based on their own unique challenges and populations, sort of fine tune the keys of those, of those programs for change and use them to ultimately improve health. Um, two really big components of the healthcare law that are very exciting as far as prevention are at the national level. We have a new public health fund uh, that over the next 10 years has uh, appropriations of almost $15 billion in mandatory spending for public health programs. This is a huge uh, success for the, for the public health um, folks. But you know, ultimately, we need um, leadership and mobilization of leadership to support the replication of these programs, so to implement this funding in a way that is really meaningful. Um, and we've already released about 500 million in fiscal 2010, and we'll release another 750 million soon in 2011. And the president's 2012 budget uh, includes just an unprecedented amount of funding for prevention as well. We also have a new uh, council for health promotion and disease prevention. This is the national level sort of kitchen cabinet, as I like to say, of um, folks who are invested in uh, models that work, and we'll be releasing a, a health promotion and disease prevention strategy for the nation. So this is a partnership between um, federal agencies and leaders and um, private sector leaders. And so, again, just returning to the theme of taking what we know, applying it in a way that uh, has been proven effective and allowing some flexibility for how we um, make these programs work at the community level. And for those of you who are interested in what our health goals, goals are as a nation, you can go to healthypeople.gov, which is the federal government's sort of roadmap for, for change. And we have 42 different topic areas, um, everything from LGBT health, which is a new topic area this year, to uh, tobacco cessation, healthcare access and quality, maternal and child health. Um, we have our 
baseline of where we are at now with the percentage of the population that is affected by the particular health issue, and then our target for 2020. We um, release healthy people goals every 10 years. So this is just a tremendously rewarding time to be working in public health, not just as a public health leader in the sector of public health, but for all of us. We know what the goals are. Um, healthy People also has a section for the interventions that work. So I encourage any of you for the topic of your interest to go onto that site and look and see um, where we are, where we're headed, and to think about how you can make an impact in your organization to get to a place where we have a healthier nation. Thank you, Julie. That was great. So um, these are three of our fabulous alums, but you're, the, you're also our fabulous alums, and we'd like to hear from you, hopefully, to having teed up uh, the, the beginning of a broader conversation on all sector uh, thoughts on fostering the public's health. I'll start over there. Yes. I'm Laura Kelly. I'm a student at the School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. El Satter, I was wondering if you could talk about what do, what do you think are some ways to improve the implementation science issue in public health you discussed? Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, a very important question, and maybe we'll define what is the implementation science. I think the, uh, I mean, traditionally, when people have thought of research, they've thought of basic research or clinical research, and they haven't really thought about what's called implementation research or implementation science. And implementation science gets at exactly that gap that I was talking about, which is the how of taking knowledge, the how you assess, implement, how you assess various models of implementation of programs and really evaluate them appropriately and, and, and learn from them in order to be able to scale them up. There are many different things that should be done. One is clearly to um, entice young people, students, faculty, to be interested in this kind of endeavor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a new scholarly endeavor that's kind of a little bit alien to the usual uh, generation of knowledge framework. It is generation of knowledge, but it is rather alien to the traditional generation of knowledge framework. So I think getting faculty, getting researchers, getting students to be very, uh, to be attuned to what this means and to be excited at doing the kind of research that would address some of these very important key issues in terms of global health. I think another is to actually support this kind of research and this kind of science. It's again, it's not one of the, it needs funding from funders, whether it be uh, by foundations or by uh, CDC or USAID or NIH, for example, of this kind of endeavor of how do you take knowledge into action is very important. And there's a, a huge gap in funding for this kind of work as well. And I think lastly, of course, is that to, uh, for us as a, as a scholarly community is to be at the forefront of trying to, to, uh, to generate this kind of information through this kind of work. Thank you. We'll go to the other microphone. Hi, I'm Scott Tadakin, Columbia College, 1987. And I've heard a lot of talk about prevention. I've heard a lot of talk about smoking cessation or childhood obesity. And I'm concerned about a problem that may not be entirely preventable, um, a period of disability in the very latest years of life. And I wondered wh whether public health professionals think about this period and the tremendous impact that it's going to have fiscally and also societally on the developed world, having so many aged people and so few people to take care of them. So I think that one has my name all over it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take it if anybody wants to add something. Uh, one of the really remarkable things is that we are going through a demographic revolution, I would say, that the success of public health in the main, supported by great medicine and medical care, is that we've almost doubled life expectancy in the last 100 years. Pretty fabulous, <laughs> that was our goal. Um, and people are getting to live much longer lives, uh, but there are high risk, particularly as people develop um, what we wrongly call non-communicable chronic diseases, um, that rates of disability are high in association with that. Um, 
one of the necessities, of course, in a compassionate society is to support, uh, going back to the quote that Julie uh, gave us at the very beginning, is to support the most vulnerable parts of society and meet their needs and uh, support autonomy of people even when they're disabled as much as possible. And certainly in an aging society, it's critical that we do that. Uh, but um, remarkably, a significant proportion of disabilities um, are associated with aging are preventable. And uh, there's good evidence now that they're preventable both by preventing the chronic diseases that cause them, they're preventable by taking approaches um, actually in the face of early disability to ameliorate it. Uh, and they are modifiable by um, providing supportive environments that permit people to compensate in one way or another for their disability. So we know a lot now. We don't know everything we need to know, but I think we know a lot now uh, about how to improve people's function and ability to remain engaged in the world into the older stages. Um, some of, and we need a, a mixed portfolio, if you will, of prevention, care, and supportive services to accomplish that, uh, hopefully while improving the health with which people age. Thank you. Go back over here. Yes, hi. Uh, you mentioned that public health got a good boost in the bill, but on state and local levels, it's getting battered, in good part because it's tarred with the brush of the nanny state. What are each of you, if you just go through, what are you doing to separate, even to the more conservative of our brothers and sisters who are out there, to separate to say, no, this is not a, a liberal or conservative issue. This is simply about getting information out on good sense. Julie, you wanted to start, make that? I, you know, I think, um, the first thing I would say about um, the importance of this law is that we have you know, close to 50 million people in this country who don't have a regular access to care, uh, ability to see a physician regularly. And so this is only one component of the larger um, challenge to prevention. And I think we need to have the access issue dealt with. When you have 16 to 17% of the population that is not able to get care, you know, you're not able to um, have your public health programs work as effectively if you're meeting these individuals at stages where their disease is already advanced. So it's important that we get these folks into the system. As Cheryl said, it's not a, a perfect law, but it is a good, first step, and I think we have to make these investments now as, um, as as much as they will cost now, they will cost us far more later if we don't invest now ensuring that people get into the system, that we bring down costs, and that we ultimately improve quality, and that's just not quality in the healthcare system, but also quality in the public health system. And so one of the conversations that we're having now at the state level is, what is the role of public health in ensuring quality? And so we have these two sort of separate quality conversations happening at the same time. Ultimately, we're hoping to bring down costs, but um, I think we won't see some of that initially. That'll sort of come in stages. And I'm not sure what the alternative is. I mean, to leave that percentage of the population without care, it just doesn't bode well for us, and certainly from a competitive standpoint as well. I mean, if you're a business and you're hiring employees, you want them to be healthy. You don't want to be absorbing those costs in the future. So um, I think it's something that we have a moral obligation to do and how we sort of fine tune those components and what that looks like in states is uh, an evolving challenge and conversation. And so we're trying to give states some flexibility to implement the law uh, given the challenges that they have. Thank you. I, I uh, just saw the sign that says that we have four more minutes to this session, so I'm going to do my best to get through everybody who's uh, at the mics, it, but uh, if, if everyone can be brief, we'll, we might we have a prayer getting there. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm Beth Lucio. I'm a graduate, 97 graduate of both the College of Physici Physicians and Surgeons and the um, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. 
And one of the things that I've noticed as a physician is that in medical school, we weren't really, um, we didn't talk much about what health means. We mostly had this sort of unstated concept that what health means is no disease. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed after treating patients now for some time is that we really focus on this idea of health as no disease, as the absence of disease, and even in some ways as some sort of perfection, like you don't even age, you'll be health. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that to live healthy lives both as individuals and as a society, we need to start thinking about health as sometimes living with disease, sometimes living with aging, which we all have to do, and also living with dying, and that we need to sort of return to a way of thinking about health as not eradicating or fixing things necessarily, although that's a part of it, but also how to incorporate living healthily with whatever state we're in. And I was wondering from the public health standpoint whether you have a definition of health or whether that's sort of part of the ongoing discussion. Mm -hmm. You said that so eloquently that I'm not sure the rest of us can add uh, uh, without detracting, but uh, does anyone want to add to that? And I can add a word or two. I, I do agree with you. I think we've uh, narrowly defined prevention, I believe. I think we've defined prevention and we sort of we thought of public health as prevention of disease. And, and unfortunately, we know that some people will get some disease because we don't have solutions. We don't have 100% prevention interventions. So we need to broaden. I believe we should broaden the definition of public health. It's, it's really prevention of disease, but it's also really prevention of disability and morbidity, mortality from disease. And I think you can see that very uh, graphically when you look at, for example, diabetes. Certainly we can try to prevent diabetes. But also when you look at the outcome of someone who has diabetes, uh, who has access to health care, versus someone from a developing country who has nothing, you will see that their outcome is very different. And these disparities exist within our own society. So I think that when all we broaden, I believe that public health needs to be much broader than just total prevention as we as it has been traditionally conceptualized, to also prevention of disability as well as uh, morbidity or disability as well. And I, that's why I think really uh, this is a great moment for public health because it's, it has such a broad platform, uh, working at, uh, at individual level but working at a population level, both hand in hand. Thank you. Dr. Herbert. Um, I'm John Herbert, uh, PNS uh, class of whenever. In Columbia College. <laughs> um, my question is, do you think the American people are willing to pay for the application of the knowledge that we've gained to prevent disease, to cure disease? I mean, we're already at, uh, last time I looked, greater than 15% of our GDP. We're spending over $2 trillion in health care. And uh, even with the new bill, which is a great step in the right direction, it's going to cost us more money. Do you think society is willing to make the sacrifices necessary to pay to make us healthy. I mean, clearly, we won't change our diets, we won't change our exercise. Everybody here has probably been to McDonald's, uh, but at least nobody's smoking in this room. But are we willing to make the rest of the sacrifices? So I, I, I'm gonna take that one and, and say that um, there are two thoughts. First of all, the Trust for America's Health reported last year uh, uh, on analyses that have been much needed that show that there is a six-fold return on investment for prevention uh, of the vast uh, breadth that we've been talking about. And the time frame on that is not 50 years, it's three years to six years. Um, and ongoing investment yields ongoing return on investment. So we're not talking about somewhere in the 22nd century that we would see the benefits. Um, I think the ultimate answer to your question depends on the people in this room. And it depends on leadership and the ability to help people uh, set their sights on who we want to be. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm Robert Wilbur. I've been active in the United Nations Association. And looking at um, progress or lack of it toward the Millennium Development Goals, 
I get the unfortunate conclusion that efforts, and we're going back to the gap between knowledge and implementation, that progress is being overwhelmed, at least in Africa, by population growth. And so my question would be, to what extent is population growth, which you haven't mentioned uh, today, a, a factor in your thinking in academia about global health issues? Mm -hmm. There's so many things we haven't mentioned today, but I'm going to turn to Wafo to see if you want to respond. Well, I, I, um, I think I agree with you that in terms of the Millennium Development Goals, there, it's probably clear that many of the most severely affected countries are not going to reach their goals. It doesn't mean there hasn't been progress, and that's kind of unfortunate is that there's been tremendous progress that's been achieved already, and especially when you go region by region and country, specific country by country. So I think we should really applaud the progress because I think it, it ends up being a bit demoralizing for countries that have really tried very hard. There's been progress in maternal mortality, there's been progress in under five mortality, substantial progress. There's been progress obviously in HIV, even in tuberculosis. So I think we're seeing these curves Hello. improving uh, over time and, uh, and actually going back to an improvement in life expectancy in some of the most severely affected countries. Nonetheless, I think there are many reasons why countries cannot reach, some countries will not reach one or the other of the Millennium Development Goals. Could be the resources, could be war, civil strife, it could be governance within the country itself. And population growth is one aspect of, of, of that whole effort. But there have also been remarkable advances as well in terms of population growth. There are many, many countries where we're seeing the fertility rate go down. Uh, we know that with educating women, that's a very important aspect of decreasing fertility is by women being educated. There remains a huge gap in terms of access to uh, contraceptive methods in some countries. So I, I think it's one component. It, it, it is one of the issues that many countries are tackling, and I, clearly in some of the countries where we work, uh, family planning is at the top of, of the agenda uh, of, uh, in the context of all the many, many other health threats and challenges that some of these countries are facing. Thank you. Um, I have to ask the timekeepers, can we, do we have time to uh, take the remaining <laughs> questions? No? Um, well, I, I <laughs> this one's out of my control, uh, but we are happy to talk to any of you afterwards who, who have questions, and uh, with such an excited uh, group to continue the discussion. Thank you all so much to our panelists. Thank you. And now it's my uh, honor and pleasure to reintroduce President Lee Bollinger.